happening tonight in Vancouver. With BC now covering the cost of a couple sick days, it may be a little easier to stay home when sick. These three days allows you to take the time to get a test and an appropriate period of time to get those results. If case numbers are down and uh, if over 75% of people get vaccinated, we can have a summer that'll be much better for everyone. The Prime Minister presenting a roadmap to normalcy, and he's considering some controversial ways to get there. I attended so many funerals, I can't even tell you. As gang violence continues to flare in Metro Vancouver, we look at gang life prevention in schools, especially now as some districts have ended their school liaison officer programs. This is City News Everywhere. The province is ponying up to cover the cost of a few sick days for workers who don't have them. The aim is to make it easy, at least easier, to err on the side of caution with COVID. Take the time to get a test and an appropriate period of time to get those results. And then you can make decisions about how you engage with the federal government for the programs that exist there or through uh, WorkSafe for the programs on that side. WorkSafe covers workplace illness claims. The federal sickness benefit covers most other workers. Both, though, require applications and waiting. The province hoping three paid days, covered first by employers, then reimbursed up to $200 a day by the province, is what people need. We wanted to make sure that there was consistency of payment. We believe the three days covers that access and then allowing uh, employees to access other programs that are in place at the provincial level or at the federal level. The head of the Surrey Board of Trade says it's a good start for workers and businesses, but is concerned about the timing for businesses who will be out of pocket covering the cost of sick days until the province pays them back. That uh, the reimbursement happen quickly because uh, they can't wait and wait and wait for money to come into their bank account. There is support for the overall plan, especially the fact they're legislating the pay time and then replacing it with an ongoing program in January, but it could still be better. We shouldn't be shortchanging that right to uh, pay time off when we know how critical it is to ensure that uh, workers stay home when they have symptoms uh, and that they have real certainty about uh, what their pay is going to be when they do that. It's a good start. Uh, obviously, you know, we, we, we're still going to push for more. The Premier's been pushing for a national sick pay program since last year and hasn't given up. But for now, these three provincially reimbursed days off are in place until the end of the year as the province plans for its permanent replacement. Six months to consult with business is appropriate. I, would I have preferred a better outcome? Absolutely. But I'm doing the best with what we've got in the time available. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yuzda. BC is reporting another 515 cases of COVID-19, and two more people have died in the last day. 426 people are currently in hospital, 141 in intensive care. Just over 2.2 million doses of vaccine have been dispensed across the province. About 110,000 doses are second doses. This decision was made out of an abundance of caution due to an observed increase in the rare blood clotting condition known as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia linked to AstraZeneca vaccine. Ontario is joining the list of provinces sidelining AstraZeneca after 2 million Canadians have already received the COVID-19 vaccine as their first dose. The number of rare blood clot cases linked to the AstraZeneca shot has risen, prompting the decision by health officials in that province. Alberta making a similar move, saying the increasing supply of Moderna and Pfizer vaccines coming into Canada helps make the switch possible. Those two vaccines use a different technology than AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca and have not been linked to rare blood clots. Ontario's top doctor says those who already got the shot shouldn't be worried. We maintain that those who received their first dose with the AstraZeneca vaccine did absolutely the right thing to prevent illness and to protect their families, loved ones and communities. This vaccine is a uh provide significant protection from serious illness, hospitalization and death, um, and has provided that protection to hundreds of thousands of people in Ontario, uh, with unfortunately a small number of uh, adverse effects. 
So what happens to those who are waiting for a second dose? The National Vaccine Committee is currently studying whether those who got an AstraZeneca shot can safely receive another vaccine as their second dose. Researchers are also looking into whether it might still be safe enough to administer AstraZeneca as a second dose. If case numbers are down and uh, if over 75% of people get vaccinated, we can have a summer that'll be much better for everyone. The Prime Minister presenting a roadmap to normalcy. Over a year into the pandemic, Trudeau says there is a light at the end of the tunnel if everyone's on board. We have more and more uh, vaccines coming in. We're going to be able to have enough doses so that we can have that one dose summer, which will set us up for a two dose fall, which will be much, much better. Nearly 40% of Canadians have received their first COVID vaccine. Most experts say that number has to reach at least 75% before things can go back to normal. And the Prime Minister says he's considering a controversial way to get there, a COVID vaccine passport. The idea of uh, proof of vaccination for different services or better access is something to look at. A vaccine passport has already been introduced in places like Denmark, but many experts believe the idea may infringe on people's privacy and leave others who aren't able to get a vaccine behind. It's something the Prime Minister says he's considering. It matters to know uh, that Canadians are getting vaccinated. And I think we should be able to walk the path between respecting uh, someone's privacy, but also understanding that whether or not someone's vaccinated uh, is something that we should be able to, uh, to make use of. Canadians coast to coast to coast are itching to get back to normal. This and epidemiologist kind of believes we must really first get at least 75% of the population vaccinated, and we should be following the lead of other countries which have seen successes. We should follow suit countries uh, like Israel. We should be following the United Kingdom that kept those layers of protection quite strictly in place while they very efficiently rolled out the vaccine program. That's where we see the significant de-escalation of cases. In Ottawa, Nigel Newlove, City News. I am noticing that showing our online is becoming maybe more accepted by people. The world of art is changing, but that might not be a bad thing. One Metro Vancouver artist says she's been using her pandemic free time to further her skill, and she doesn't think she's alone. I'm appalled, as all British Columbians are, with the escalation of gang violence in the Lower Mainland and indeed across British Columbia and in urban centres. Premier John Horgan underlining the severity of continuing gang-related violence in the province. We need to make sure that we're focused like a laser on addressing the criminality here. Part of the work that goes into addressing that criminality has always involved education and prevention in schools. But in late April, the Vancouver School Board voted to end their 50-year-old school liaison officer program. Many in policing find that disappointing, and now the province finds itself in this moment of heightened gang violence. It's completely vital for kids to get the appropriate information about the dangers of gangs, how they will come and recruit you without you even knowing. Retired VPD detective Doug Spencer is worried we'll see the kind of violence he saw when Vancouver's school liaison officer program was stopped briefly in the late 90s. Over the next two or three years, what resulted in the kids recruited out of Vancouver schools is that I attended so many funerals, I can't even tell you. In a statement, Vancouver School Trustee Carmen Cho says the board recognizes that there is work to be done and we will establish communication protocols and points of contact in the event of school emergencies, lockdowns, critical incidents and violent threat risk assessments. Gang deterrence continues to be of utmost importance and trustees with staff will be engaging with police services, community groups and other resources in the coming months. The everyday goings on at a school to not have an officer there to deal with all of that stuff. There's, you know, kids that are suicidal. There's kids stuck on drugs. You got all this stuff going on where police are there as a resource to direct them towards the professionals and the, the healthcare workers and the social workers they need. 
and that's gone. Meanwhile, in Surrey, the Safe Schools program has a number of different staff to support youth, and RCMP officers are not stationed at any schools. So when we talk about our response, our Safe Schools response in Surrey, uh, certainly the RCMP play a, a valuable role in it, but they're not the only piece. In fact, the only people that we have stationed in every secondary school are Safe School staff, and they're more aligned along uh, the skill set of a youth care worker. Rob Ray says no matter who a young person works with, the important thing is they have a strong mentor are available to them. When we talk about young people, and a lot of these people that, that are involved in gang violence, I, I've seen them grow up since they were 10 or 12 years old. If you had a healthy role model, a mentor that was there to say, whoa, I don't know what you're up to there, you might want to reconsider that, I bet you, and I know a lot of young people would say, I think you're right. In Vancouver, Kier Junos, City News. The RCMP's major crime unit is investigating the discovery of two bodies in a remote area near Penticton. Police say a couple walking in the Naramata Creek area made the discovery yesterday morning. While police and the coroner work to identify the deceased, police say early reports suggest this was a targeted attack. Safe supplies and we don't die. Dozens of people took to the streets of Vancouver Tuesday afternoon opposing the so-called Vancouver model for drug decriminalization. It comes after a coalition of advocacy organizations penned an open letter to all levels of government, saying the proposal excluded drug users and asking to halt the move towards possible drug decriminalization in the city. The march was organized by the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. If the Vancouver model is not stopped now, the City of Vancouver and Health Canada will set a deadly precedent for public policy, not only in Vancouver, but across Canada and beyond. The coalition also says the city's current proposal for decriminalization gives police too much decision-making power over the development of the model. And the model's proposed threshold amounts for simple possession are unrealistic and too low. In an emailed statement, Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart said, Vancouver's application to Health Canada to decriminalize simple possession is based on the best available science and informed by consultation with a wide variety of stakeholders, including people with lived experience. We respect the views of Van Du and other groups, welcome their continued advocacy, and hope we will continue to work together to update the model. Well, the city of Vancouver says racism, hate, and violence of any kind has no place here after a, a report from Bloomberg named the city the capital of Asian hate crimes in North America. In a release, the city says it recognizes anti-Asian racism, among other forms of racism, is deeply rooted in the history of Vancouver and across Canada. It says it's hosting conversations with community leaders to find ways to tackle the problem. Mayor Kennedy Stewart's office says he isn't commenting to Today, but we'll have a press conference tomorrow. Nat Bailey Stadium is empty tonight. It would normally be packed with thousands of baseball fans checking out the home opener for the Vancouver Canadians. But instead, the team's home opener is happening in Hillsborough, Oregon, because of the pandemic. Tyler Zickel is the team's broadcaster. Tonight, not going to be a packed house, certainly not going to be anything like what it normally is at the Nat. But that being said, as the summer goes along, as people start to find out, hey, we are here in Hillsboro. There's baseball at this facility every single day this summer between us and the Hops. They're going to start showing up and they're going to have a great time. So certainly looking forward to getting more fans in the building. We had some C's fans uh, submit some fan cutouts, kind of like what you've been seeing at the major league level. So those are behind our C's dugout on the third base side. So we're doing everything we can to turn this into Nat Bailey Stadium South. And we're going to get there. We're going to bring the energy. But for now, the focus is just getting back on the field and having the Canadians play some baseball for the first time in 20 months. He says Canadians are selling tickets for home games in Hillsboro, although he admits crowds could be small to start. Capacity at the ballpark in Oregon is about 800 because of COVID-19 restrictions. With the pandemic, we had um, a little bit more time in our studio than usual. Um, we always spend a lot of time there, but especially this year. One Metro Vancouver artist is getting ready to showcase her work capturing the city in stunning detail following a year of pandemic painting. Emily Fantuz says she really started working on this body of work last spring, dedicating her new surplus of free time to painting. 
one of my big themes is to focus on kind of unexpected beauty or stopping to notice everyday things that can often be overlooked. She's been spending her days working here in her Langley studio alongside her husband, Mike, who just happens to be an artist too. We, we have a, a little small studio right now. This will be my, my largest piece for the show here at Granville Street. Um, I paint on a glass palette. We have a lot of, of storage back here and um, stretcher bars so we can uh, stretch the frame to make our, our paintings and big rolls of canvas. Um, so it's our little, our little corner of the world. <laughs> Emily's tools, however, are a little unusual. She's what you call a palette knife artist. That means other than prepping the canvas, no brushes. So they look like this. So it's kind of like a steel flexible spatula. It's a technique she says she picked up after leaving her home in Metro Detroit to live in Hawaii before settling here in the Lower Mainland. I just really loved how the work had really beautiful texture. You kind of talked about some opportunities to show. You're having a show not and not too far in the future. Do you, uh, how, what, what's it like now trying to show art and trying to share it when people are a little bit more apprehensive? So I'm really grateful that there's still opportunities for artists to show work in person because nothing beats that. Um, but that being said, I am noticing that showing art online is becoming maybe more accepted by people. Now, Emily and Mike's show isn't until the fall, but in the meantime, she says they will continue to dedicate their extra free time to completing their work. She says she's optimistic other artists are finding opportunities for growth as well. I really hope that ultimately we can think of this as a gift of time, you know, for us artists that we've had to develop our practice um, and that ultimately it will bring us all greater growth and, and good things moving forward. <laughs> In Vancouver, David Zura, City News. Vancouver's news is always available on the radio with News 1130 or online anytime at citynews1130.com. Your next edition of City News is tonight at 11. Thank you for watching and have a great night.